Do not panic. These slides, I've just updated them to the new style and I've fixed a couple of typos and changed squidgy little things. They're pretty much exactly the same as what I've shown, I've had available for you in the past. I will go and swap them over. Please don't print them out again if you've already printed them. There's really nothing extra. Okay, so this slide pack, um, as you know, I do a lot of work for different law firms and one of the things I do sometimes is talk to their graduates and talk to them about the actual craft of lawyering. So this presentation was initially prepared for that purpose uh, and I've just whacked in a few things for the artificial world of the law school. Um, so there are I, I'm hoping that it's something that remains useful to you going forward, particularly if you're going to do clerkships or intern with people to sort of think about how to write in practice. Um, I have pointed out the things that you need to do for the real world too, uh, sorry, for university too, um, and I'm going to try and be as clear as I can uh, where there are things that are going to affect your mark. So um, I know a lot of, when I get feedback, it's often a little bit robust about how I apparently go off track and talk about things that you're not interested in. Um, you should be interested in everything I have to say because it's all gold. It just might not necessarily be gold for right now. Uh, so my bargain in exchange for that is I am as clear as I can possibly be about what it is that you need to do to get good marks in this subject and then you humour me by listening to me to tell you when I tell you stuff that makes you good lawyers later on, even though some of you don't want to be lawyers, I get that, that's fine too. So, basically, there is no right or wrong way, um, but there is a common and ordinary way to do it, and unless, and I would suggest that you do this with all kind of written assessment, unless you've got a good reason to stray from the normal model, stick with the normal model. Um, so, you can structure it as you set it suits your purposes. I'm going to talk you through a very traditional structure and a structure that is easy for those of us who are doing the marking to look for things that we're looking for in order to reward you for marks. You need to know, hey, there's a lot of you. There's only one of me and I'm cranky. So I have secured some assistance with marking. I will be hovering over the shoulder of the other marker, but you won't necessarily, it won't necessarily be me that's marking your paper. All right, so my colleague will be listening to this um, and we will be looking at what we're doing to make together to make sure that we moderate it, um, but she will also be looking at this piece of paper here. So you will know that it is fair. So the structure, having said that it, we're going to look at a traditional structure, the structure um, serves a number of different purposes. Uh, it, and when you're thinking about what structure any piece of written work should be, you need to think about what the purpose of this document is and who its audience is. So in this particular case, you have been asked to write to your boss. So what do we know about your boss? Lawyer. They're a lawyer, right? So what does that mean? We can, use, we can use legal or technical legal terms. I would avoid jargon as such, um, and there's probably only a, a slight difference, but you can be more technical in the language than you might be if you were writing to somebody who didn't have a law degree. Um, what about case law? Do you think case law is of interest to another lawyer? You're saying no, you're saying yes. yes. Okay, let me go with a no first, why not? So again, so Subi's saying there's, um, they've got so much to read, they've got so much to do and I completely agree with that. They do not, you're absolutely right, they do not want to read every case. 
Um, one of the mistakes that many junior lawyers have made is front up to their supervising partner with, you know, like cases like this that they could barely carry and it's like they've found absolutely everything. I was talking to the general counsel of one of the top 20 companies in Australia, the top 20 listed companies, about what they like their, uh, from their lawyers and what they don't like and one of the first things that came out in that conversation, I've been doing a lot of that research lately, was I just want the answer. I, I think it's lazy. They've got some junior to go around and find all of the relevant cases and they clearly haven't had time to edit it up and just give me the stuff that matters. I just need the stuff that matters. And actually your boss only wants the stuff that matters too. Um, all of you have come across that metaphor of the iceberg, yeah? You understand this idea of you know, there's the ocean and there's an iceberg. It's actually usually more like that. So we see the bit that's above the water and there's all this stuff that has happening under the water. Okay? Your boss needs to see the stuff that's above the water and to trust you that it only floats because you've done the work that needs to be done under here. A lot of what we're going to be talking about is making some judicious choices about what to include and what to exclude. One of the most difficult things you will find is not how do I write, what is it, two and a half or three thousand words? Three thousand words? Three thousand words. It's, you will not be worried how do I write three thousand words, you'll be how do I get it down to three thousand words. That will be a constant battle and how you do that is you've got it's just as important what you decide to leave out as what you keep in. Okay, so having said that, they don't want copies of the cases. They don't want big extracts of the cases or of the legislation. They want the one line that says what it means. And they want to know that every time you talk about what the law is, that you can support your statement about what the law is with a case, or a piece of legislation, and if you have an opinion about what the law should be, it's really good if you can support that with some, more, or what the, where the law is going to go, with either some cases, a line of cases that supports that uh, theory, or if you can't find that, or even if you can, some peer-reviewed journal articles. So my colleagues who work here full-time, that's what they do. They sit there, they think deeply, about the law, they write it down, they get in A-star journals and then you can read it and go from there, okay? Can't find a peer-reviewed <coughs> journal article, your text, this is contract law. Chances are your boss has the same contract textbook that you do. But why do we have to follow other people's opinion when you are actually caught? Uh, well, we'll talk about opinion in a minute. You don't necessarily have to follow somebody's opinion, but you need to recognise that other opinions are, exist. So if you have an opinion that is absolutely your own, um, and this, is, this particular task is not a, uh, a task where you're talking about law reform or uh, you're talking about what the law should be so much. I mean, you can do that, but you'll be answering a different question and that will not be good. But, um, uh, but the thing is, with anything, with any, of, um, any academic work, if you have an opinion you need to demonstrate who has a similar opinion to you, particularly if your opinion is based on um, you've thought about what writer so-and-so said and you agree with 80%, but what about this other idea that you're adding on, acknowledging what's gone before. And also when people have different ideas from you, acknowledging these are the opinions of other people and I don't agree with them for these reasons. That is good, robust academic writing. Um, so your boss, what, what do they need this, why are they asking you to prepare this memo? What are they going to do with it? They're going to provide some advice to whom? Uh, their client. To the client. So what they, and how are they going to do that, do you think? They're going to write a letter, send an email, have a telephone conversation? Sorry, say, can you say that again? Probably start with a phone call. So what, basically, what your, your client in this case is your boss. The person, the reader of this is your boss. And your boss needs this piece of uh, paper 
in order for them to know what to do next. So basically, do I need to ring my client to ask him some questions? Do I need to ring my client to tell him what I think the answer is? Um, hint, the better papers will tell us what the, answers, the answer is, but they might be qualified in the sense of, I'll assume that the answer is this, but I need, we would need to check ABC facts first. Or, you know, that will be your next step. No, you can assume that the facts that you've got are the same facts that Dennis has got. You want to try and write it so it stands alone, um, but you don't want to be spending a lot of time rehashing the facts. And, and I, I will spell that out in a second. I hope. I can't remember what I'm going to say. So, Oh, I told you this before, draws very heavily on some work that I did for another purpose and again, it's because I want to tell you how to be good lawyers, tell you like as if you can listen. Um, so there's no magic to getting started with a memo, right? But structure it as a memo. Um, get a template if you haven't used one before. If you do not know how to use the basics of Word, particularly if you don't know about numbering paragraphs, now is the time to learn because you've got a lot of time ahead of you writing this stuff and being able to do auto cross references and stuff like that is a skill that will be helpful to you. I know you don't value it um, and lots of other people don't value it either, um, but you really miss it when it's not done. So a memo usually looks like this. Um, if you go into Word or just even Google memo template, you'll get lots of them. They're lovely uh, and they will work. So, do you want to include a table of contents with your memo? Um, it's completely up to you. Do think about your word count here. Um, it is a really good idea to use clear headings. Um, clear headings make it really easy for somebody to navigate. As a rule of thumb, I would suggest if whatever you're going to present to somebody is 10 pages or more, a table of contents is a good idea. Does a couple of things. Um, the person who is marking your work, it's one of the first things that they can see and they can see kind of an overview of the structure of where you're going. Um, and sometimes, particularly if you're not strong at signposting, it's really easy to read something and say, oh, why are you talking about that? What about blah, blah, blah? And you write a big long comment and then four pages later, you start talking about blah, blah, blah. I go back and I delete my comment and then I go back to where you were and I say, would have been great if you signposted you were gonna deal with this blah, blah, blah. You know, but table of contents helps me see where you're going if you've got good headings. Again, Word will generate that stuff for you. If you set up the styles correctly, if you have your headings in a heading style, it can create a table of contents for you. Please don't ask me for advice about giving you it with Word because chances are I'll give it to you and then neither of us will have enough time. Um, YouTube, great for that stuff. Google it. Everybody uses Word. It's easy to get. Um, and yeah, that's, sorry, that's Bill Gates. That's my little joke, he can do it. So, where do you start? Again, the research I've been doing recently, working with um, consumers of significant amounts of legal services, is the one thing that they want is an executive summary. Um, most commercial people want things in a page, or more recently they say, I don't want to have to swipe on my phone more than twice. They want a clear cut statement at the very beginning of a document that they could just take that bit and put it in front of their board of directors. So a self-contained little executive summary of the answer. And sometimes because we have, and we talked about this in week one, we have this, this moral hazard issue as lawyers, right? We know more than our clients about their problem. So sometimes being a good lawyer includes you have to articulate really clearly, you have this problem for these reasons. They didn't even realise they had a problem, right? You have this problem, we need to know X. The law works in this way, 
you're going to win, you're going to lose. Unfortunately, it's usually not that easy. Um, part of what this needs to do is identify the scope of the instructions. So sometimes in, in both letters and memos, starting up front and saying, I'm going to consider whether or not there is a contract. If there is a contract, then we will be able to uh, identify whether that contract's been breached and what the consequences of that breach will be. But today we're not going to talk about breach or the consequences of breach. That's outside the scope of what you want me to look at, Dennis. I'm only going to answer the question whether there's a contract. And then the next step will be blah, blah, blah. Or maybe straight away, I didn't, I'm of the view that there is no contract, so breach and damages is irrelevant, however you want to do. Um, brevity is key here. This is the thing, if, and often, here's a confession from the field, when I'm working with smart people who I trust, and I'm really busy and heaven forbid that they get me the thing that they're doing for me just minutes before I go into the meeting. Maybe that's all I read is that front page straight away. Clients will do it all the time too. And then I know I've got the whole thing and I know because of the way that it's structured that in the meeting if I get asked a question that goes into the detail, I'll be able to pull it out and work with that in the meeting. But Sometimes just having that overview, I can go into the meeting with the client and say, this is the situation. So it's just as useful for your boss, okay? And one of the things you're gonna to wanna to do when you are young lawyers in the field is you're gonna to wanna to make yourself as useful to your boss as you can be. Because unless you're bringing a multi-billion dollar client with you into the law firm, the world ain't like suits, sadly. So all of you are all just as good looking, I'd like to say, particularly those of you who print a lot. <laughs> facts, setting out the facts. Okay, so this came to your question before. Okay, you don't want to waste words on the facts here. So the trick with writing about the facts is being judicious. Do I need to talk about that facts or can I just state them. The only reason I think your boss needs you to particularly point out a fact is because that fact is particularly important to the answer. Or there is a gap in the facts where you have to make an assumption or that you are reading them in a particular way and you're aware that they could be read in another way, you might want to point that out. Um, because your job is to try and solve the question and <coughs> solve the problem. And if you don't know what the problem is, or if you're concerned that you might not understand the underlying foundations of the problem in some way, or you need more information, you need to point that out. Now, this here is sort of written for a larger purpose. Sometimes you might need to, in solving a problem, get some understanding of the broader world. So particularly, and this would go, you know, whilst I'm talking about memorandum in particular, this advice I think will help you in any kind of writing in the law. Sometimes you might need to ascertain how important a problem is. So for example, um, I teach a subject called information technology in the law and or the law and information technology, I always get it wrong. Anyway, um, people get to pick their own um, assignments essentially and they need to do a deep research project into uh, an area of technology. Um, and so, and they pick, pick really interesting things but one of the things that they need to do is really set up whether something's really a problem or not. So um, I had a really interesting paper about the use of um, virtual child pornography both as an entrapment device for, um, for pedophiles and as a treatment option. Um, so very difficult problem. So that paper supported this very complex web of issues with data about how big the problem of pedophilia was. It's kind of, you know, and I know this is completely irrelevant to here, but I don't want to give you too many clues for this particular task. 
but by actually providing, you know, World Health Organization data and Interpol data and a range of other things, they're able to set that up. So again, it's the same with any kind of academic writing. If you are going to state a fact, support that fact with data. Now, facts in our scenario, it's the scenario, right? So it's made up. It didn't happen, okay? It's, I made it up. Um, but if you're talking about what usually happens in relation to these things, you might want to look at some other data uh, and you might look for data in some way. Now, hopefully, this, I'm hoping this is a pretty easy problem and that it's been designed to just get you to focus on the law and not have to go too far. But if you do talk about data, if you do talk about, I don't know, the likelihood of boats being damaged while they're being docked in Williamstown, you might get some weather data from the bomb or something like that, I don't know. If you have a disagreement or uncertainty about the facts, state both options, okay? Pick a side, be reasonable, we use an objective test, right? So if you're thinking, well, it is likely that, you know, Fred had a sailing licence or whatever. By the way, don't worry about stuff like that. That's, it's, yeah, don't worry about anything but the contract problem. But if, just say that was one of the issues, and you think it's, you know, it's likely that he, you know, was, had deep water navigation rights, say, well, this is what I think based on the fact that it wasn't raised and, you know, but we should check that fact. But if you think it's, oh, I'm not sure about this or that, say, well, this is a really key fact to understanding, uh, issue to understanding, and if the answer is X, then we're going to have this result. And if the answer is Y, we're going to have that result. So, Dennis, one of the first things you're going to have to do is ask him about this hole in the story or whatever. Again, I'm not saying that there is a hole in the story either. I'm, my ability to write a scenario, amuse myself and then forget all about it is phenomenal. So, assumptions. Really just talking about. So, facts and assumptions are really closely aligned in this way. And I've got, actually when I said that the slides are the same, they're actually, they're, I will give you this later, but I'm, I made a GIF because, hey, you can. Um, and I'll explain this in a second. So, issues. So, when you look at the marking criteria, you will see that one of the largest proportion of where you get your marks for is actually whether or not you've identified the issue. All of these things are qualitative, not quantitative. There will be some people who identify 700 issues and they will not do as well as somebody who identifies four and everything in between. Because what's important here is the quality, not the quantity, okay? Now, if you miss a really key issue, that will be a problem. If you miss a number of issues but they're not important, particularly if it's clear that you have focused on the issues that you think are the most important and you've made the right choices, you will do well. Um, stating what the issues are, map the approach that you have to the problem. So it's important to articulate what the issues are and why they're an issue. Um, how many of you have seen the castle at some point? Yeah, if you haven't, you really need to because it's kind of compulsory. Um, let me tell you, Dennis Denudo is a character from the castle. Uh, he is, shall we say, not the world's best lawyer. Um, many of you who will have, have know anything about the film if you haven't seen it will know that he, you know, he appears in court and he's like asked about what section of the Constitution. He says, oh, it's the vibe, the vibe <laughs> of the Constitution. So... The funny thing is, I always pick Dennis because I reckon I worked for a guy like Dennis, the first uh, supervisor I ever had. He was a lovely guy and we did some really interesting matters, but he wasn't all that competent. He was really good at going out and bringing in clients and drinking with them and stuff like that, but he was not, he was not what we would call a lawyer's lawyer. And I know it's really unusual in the profession, but I was kind of a bit OCD and a bit focused on getting everything right. I know. That won't happen to any of you because it's quite unusual not. Um, and so he actually made me into the lawyer that I am today because I had to be, I had to double check everything because I knew he wouldn't. Uh, and so that's why I always make Dennis your boss because I think actually you need to be the young lawyers who are working for a guy 
who's probably not as smart as you and who's not going to check things really carefully. So don't assume that Dennis is smarter than you and will be able to understand the vibe of what it is that you're saying. Articulate it really carefully and as succinctly as you can. As I often say, don't worry about the word count, just make every word count. So break your issues down into sub-issues. One of the reasons that I don't, didn't want to talk about this until now is I'm hoping that all of you have done quite a bit of work on this already, that you're thinking about the problem and you're identifying the issues because sometimes too, once we start writing, we get very wedded to what we've put on the paper. So again, writing is the tip of the iceberg. You need to do the work in order to organise it. So this is my ridiculous kind of demonstration of what I was trying to show. It's just going to keep repeating. But I'm a big fan of using post-it notes to organise things. Um, it doesn't have to be post-it notes. But one of the things, colour coding helps. One of the things I'm sort of trying to show you here is that if I just keep collecting as I'm doing my research, um, I'm putting facts on a yellow post-it note, I'm writing something that I think might be an issue on a pink post-it note, and then I'm writing down relevant law, or law that I think might be relevant on the green ones, and then I'm basically sorting it out when I'm finished, and sorting it and resorting it. So as you can see here, I've just got a X, Y axis. I'm looking for well, what are the facts or assumptions that I've made, what are the legal issues that are relevant to those facts, and then what are the rules. And basically over time, I'm getting a chronology. So the idea is that this x-axis on the bottom is time, what's happening in what order. And then I'm sorting out my facts and thinking about what's relevant, thinking about how to get rid of it. Now that's, I'm a very visual person. That methodology works for me. It might not work for you. You guys are going to find your own thing that works. Um, some of you will have been really, you, you will have come from science in particular. People who come from science are often really analytical about pulling out each of the different elements. People who come from social sciences tend to be a little bit wordy, uh, tend to sort of wax lyrical, tend to tell me all the interesting things that they learnt along the way and not actually answer the question. Again, this is a really nice way or something similar to this to do that. Don't, you know, don't be afraid to write down what you think and whatever. It's just you don't have to share it with me. Um, in fact, if you really want to talk to me about it, we can do that. We can have a beer when it's all done and we can have a chat about all the things you learned. I love that, but I want you to get good marks. So the main thing that you're going to do here is actually answer my question. The other little kind of image that I made here is this approach to thinking about how to be judicious. And this came out of our discussion in the uh, online shoot on the weekend. So if we just take the key facts, uh, sorry, the key issues, working out which ones, one of the things that I think is useful, again, X, Y axis, start it again. Um, how complex, uh, sorry, how complex is the issue to deal with? Just lining them up. Okay, this is a really straightforward, easy thing to deal with. I'm going to put it at the beginning. But if it's really hard to work out, I'm going to put it at the end. And then how relevant is it to solving this problem? And where we want to spend our time is, is that stuff up the top that is complex and relevant. If it's complex and not all that relevant, then you might mention that you've noticed it, but given the facts that we have, we don't need it. You could probably leave it alone if you wanted to. If it's just a no-brainer, it's relevant to this problem, but it's you know, very straightforward, you know, state it and move on. Spend your time and energy and your words, think of words as money, spend your money up the top of that grid. And again, another reason why post-it notes are good because you can use your notes for more than one purpose. Questions, concerns, frustrations, anybody getting dizzy? Whoops. Conclusion. Now I said at the beginning, well if I didn't say it, it's written on the slide, that we would come back to the conclusion. 
in the sense that ultimately writing that introduction, that summary, is probably the very last thing that you are going to do. When you write a conclusion in this or anything else that you write, don't introduce something new. Okay? One of the things looking at a conclusion is that I want to see is that the conclusion is a logical conclusion to what you've told me above. So if you introduce some new idea or new case law um, at that point, that just means that you haven't proofed and edited and you're just essentially wasting your boss's time reading all of this stuff that isn't actually leading to what you think. Okay? So make sure you don't introduce anything new. Um, and so that's, I guess, what I mean here by write this part last but present it first. Your conclusion, um, and one of the things I often see, I don't even know really how it happens, is that people will put something in the executive summary and then the conclusion will say the exact opposite. And I'm thinking, have I told you in class that I often don't read the conclusions? Because that's true in real life, but actually I take my job pretty seriously. I will read every word that you give me um, and, you know, I, I can notice when they're different. Um, answer the question. Be direct, be clear, be complete. Don't sit on the fence, pick a side of the fence. Even if the fence is really high and you're a little bit concerned that maybe you should be on the other side of the fence, point that out, but pick a side. Make it, it think about what the purpose of this document is so that Dennis can pick up the phone and say to the client, Okay, given what we know now, we think you should start talking to the other side and settle this immediately. Given what we know now, we think you've got a pretty strong case and you should do this and that will happen, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, conclude. Don't give me another summary of all of your legal analysis. Come up with what the conclusion is. A plus B equals C. Just give me C. Um, but make sure that it makes sense. Okay, I don't want you to spend any particular amounts of time with legislation in this um, particular question. There will be some legislation that is necessary. Um, I don't want you to be doing an a, a Australian consumer law analysis at this point. But I can't in good faith say that you shouldn't look, for example, at the Electronic Transactions Victoria Act. Um, if it is vital to your summary, uh, to your conclusion, put the words in. But if you can explain it without that many words, don't worry about doing that. Give the proper section and cite it properly. Dealing with um, the real world, if you need to give your boss the actual legislation, which will happen sometimes, <coughs> add it as an appendix and attach it. Don't let it stop the flow of your work. Remember, think about your reader. I mean, communication is what the listener does. Communication is what the reader does. It doesn't actually matter what you write. What matters is what I read. And often that comes down to the way that you structure it, the headings that you use, and thinking about your end user. So think about things like how long your paragraphs are, for example. Really, really long paragraphs are exhausting. Have one idea for each paragraph and one paragraph for each idea. Um, use headings. M think about, Dennis is not that bright, right? You need to bring him along a journey with you. Uh, similarly, if you put a big swag of legislation in the middle or a big swag of case quotation in the middle, it breaks up the flow of what we're reading. So make it easy for your boss to agree with you and to see you've done a good job. So, some tips on doing that discussion or that analysis. You need to predict how a court might likely resolve this matter. You need to be clear on what you know to be true and where you are uncertain, um, but why you are falling on one side of the fence as opposed to the other. Um, you will do ethics at some point or legal practice management. Um, a lawyer's first duty is to the court. 
in many subjects that you've done in undergraduate degrees, you will have been asked to argue a case. And later on when you do moots, etc., you will be asked to argue a case for your client. But at this point we're giving advice and sometimes the best advice is actually you are better off stopping spending money and sorting this out now, you do not have a leg to stand on. Um, it is not your job to persuade us that your client is in the right just because they're your client. It is your job to identify what the law says and to explain it clearly. Group similar cases together. Now, your footnotes do not count in your word count, okay? So you can put stuff in the footnotes and people do it all the time. And if you really need to tell me another story about something that you think is really relevant, put it in the footnotes and then think about how many of the, you there are and how boring it might be to read <coughs> similar papers over and over again and then delete it. But know that you did it and I know you did it too. You can put a smiley face in or something just so we know. Um, no, you do. Footnotes don't count, all right? But they get, it gets very dense when there are pages and pages of footnotes. Um, so group similar cases together. So if, for example, you might want to talk about invitations to treat, you might want to refer to boots or to Partridge and Crittenden, or what was the other one? Fisher and Bell. Fisher and Bell. There's a line of cases. There are three of them travel in a particular direction. You might want to refer to all three of them. That's good. But you would do that in a footnote. Or, you know, and you might, or you might use language like in the line of cases ending in with boots or some Australian citation of something similar. Footnote, put all of the other ones in. Great. Okay, because think about it from the reader's point of view. One tip that I give people regularly is before you submit something, get Siri or Word or someone to read it out loud to you, a computer to read it out loud to you. Human beings fill in the gaps. They see the words that you meant to put in there and they naturally punctuate things in the way that makes sense. If you get a robot, let's face it, Word is a robot, Cortana, Siri, whoever you use, um, to read it to you, they will read exactly what's on the page. And you listen to it, it's actually a different part of your brain that's activated from your eyes. You will hear the stuff that doesn't make sense. You will hear where you need a comma to draw breath. You will hear that that paragraph or section was really long and, it, and windy. Um, but you particularly hear, if you've got lots of case citations in the middle, just how difficult it is to keep the thread of the thought when you just it's punctuated with cases all the time. So think about how to present the case. If you can put it in a footnote, do. But then in other cases, you might just, you know, like to call it, you know, in Carlyle and Carbolic smoke ball bracket, smoke built carbolic, whatever you want to, car hill, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they said blah, blah, blah. And then continue to repeat, uh, use Carl Hill in that way. Think about how to do it logically. Um, yeah, get your principles from the leading cases. Think about the authority. You don't need to explain to me whether something is persuasive or it was ratio or obita or any of those things um, if you get the best authority. Okay? If there are dissenting judgments or something, you might need to explore that in more detail. But if you get the leading cases, then we know what the authority is. And this is not cutting edge law, folks. This is contract. It's been around for a long time. Uh, address fairly, any arguments have spoken about that. Yeah, don't, yeah. Have a look at these tips as you go through. Um, it might be useful to take this presentation and tick off at the end. Just have a look. As, like, have I done that? Have I not done that? Where, you know, do, do your own review of it. You need to show your reasoning, you need to reach a conclusion and that conclusion needs to be supported by the law, not just because you think that person is nice and that they should win. Um, you need to make suitable recommendations about a course of action. So what next? Clients do not come to us because they want to know what the law is. Clients come to us because they want their problem solved. 
it's a bit like people don't go to Bunnings because they want to drill. They go to Bunnings because they need to hang a picture on their wall or they need to fix a leaky tap or whatever. They don't, the cl end client does not care what the law is, right? And if they do, they're a pain in the ass client, let me tell you. Um, but your job is to help your boss answer the client's question. Your boss cares what the law is, which is why you're going to have to give this much detail. Um, but at the end of the day, what's important is that conclusion. Think about structure, think about the hierarchy of headings. Use signposting if you need to. So if you're talking about issue black, you might say paragraph heading black. The issues with black are blah, blah, blah. Of course, you might be interested, uh, you'll be aware that we also need to think about white. That will be discussed in paragraph 5.2. Signpost, let us know. Or as, you know, as set out above, we're now going to deal with the issue white. Um, think about your writing. Start each paragraph with a topic sentence. Focus your discussion. One idea for each paragraph. Um, in real life, sometimes you will need to say, I got these instructions at 11 p.m. last night. I haven't had time to do the research yet. Um, be clear when you actually are limited by the resources you have. That is advice for real life. It's not good advice for you as students. Um, if I read, yeah, I only got your instructions, Dennis, last night, I'm putting it together now, um, but it is incomplete, I'll send you some more next Monday, I will just think you are disorganised and you probably should have started earlier. Um, having said that too, if any of you don't have the problem yet, um, you need to contact the help area and work out how to use Canvas because it's been there for a while and I'm pretty sure you should all be able to have it. Um, identify any missing pertinent information. Often that will be part of your next steps in this exercise. Dennis, we need to know whether it was a speedboat or a yacht um, because X, Y, Z will make the difference. Um, Okay, make it easy on yourself. Make it easy for me to give you good marks. Look at what the assessment criteria are and make sure you address them. Um, and stop at the end and say, okay, but answer the question. Sometimes it can be a really good thing to find somebody, ideally not a law student, give them the problem to read and then explain to them what your answer is. Okay, because when they're asking you questions about it, you will think, oh, okay, yeah, I haven't thought about that that way, or maybe I'm not so clear. Some things you'll say, oh, mum, do you really want me to make you read Carl Hill and Carbolic Smoke Ball? Don't worry about that. You'll, you'll know, but when it's like, it's a question about the logic flow, um, then you'll realise that you're not clear. Um, Okay, in assignments, go right to the end. You need to include a reference list. Dennis has specifically asked you for one. Um, not everybody does. I need to see a reference list and it needs to be formatted in accordance with AGLC3. Okay, in real life, AGLC3 reference lists are not particularly helpful and it's good to talk to your boss about the best way for them to see what you've looked at. Often I know I ask people who work for me uh, to give me details of the search criteria that they used in the databases. Um, I will also ask them to bundle certain things together. Why do I do that? Um, basically because I'm pretty lazy in a whole lot of ways and busy and your boss will be the same wherever you work. They will be looking, what they want to do is sense check. You know, you're a smart person, you've done good work I don't want to do the work again. Did you search for the kind of things I would have searched for? Because if you search for the same stuff I would have searched for, then I know you well enough at that stage to know you're probably going to get the same answers I would have got. But if you went off and searched in a completely different way, then I need to read your work in a different way. But that again is more advice for life than it is for um, uh, this assignment. Um, 
please use AGLC3. Please look very carefully. The way that you cite things in a reference list is different from how you include them and format them in footnotes. Um, it's only 10% from memory over, of your overall mark goes to uh, the way you use AGLC and your writing. Um, but they're kind of an easy 10 marks to get, the AGLC. And it breaks my heart when people write well and I can't give them anything higher than a distinction in that area because they haven't italicised cases or they've used the uh, American section squiggle instead of doing it in the Australian way or that they haven't included a reference list. On the other side, um, many of you will find writing um, for the law the most difficult thing. The good thing is in some ways that it's only 10% of your mark and I regularly have students who don't write terribly well, who get really good marks. I've uh, got to say it pisses me off uh, at one level, um, speaking as a practitioner, because writing is what we do. That is the tool of the trade. If you do not write well and clearly as a lawyer, it's very, very difficult to be a good lawyer. And so if I had my way, we would have like, it'd be a bit like word limits. We would have to have a standard of writing and I would kick you out if you didn't write well enough. But having said that, it's also a skill that you can learn. Uh, and often it's about being cons concise and precise as you can. We're not asking you to write a novel here. It doesn't need to be pretty. It just needs to be clear and answer the question. So I get that that is a really hard thing and I get that some of you will think actually on the balance of everything it's not going to help or hurt my marks too much, I'm not going to worry about it. But please do worry about it, write as well as you possibly can. There are some excellent resources that the university has available, um, both online and face to face. If you haven't already done it, uh, look for the RMIT study lab. You do know that I think every student can get up to four hours um, free essay review from uh, the study lab um, every semester. Um, they also they have a great drop-in centre over there in Building 80 for those of you who are able to be in town. Um, we do this thing called peer review, peer teaching review, which I've done for a few years now. We get matched by, with some other teacher and you get to go and watch some of their classes and they come and watch yours and we learn from each other. And last semester is the first time I've been matched with anybody outside of this school and I was matched with one of the study lab guys and I just learnt so much just about English grammar just watching him. Like, you know, so they, they will give you good tips um, they're well and truly worth talking to. Um, okay, more about language. I've got to pay more attention to what's on my slides. Um, active, concise, precise language. You are not clever just because you use the flowery, old-fashioned language that you read in Carl Hill and Carbolic Smoke Ball. You are clever if you make sense of that and you turn it into something that your boss can understand. Remember, Dennis, it's the vibe. He doesn't understand that language either, right? Help him out. Um, think about your word choices. So, stuff like, I believe, I feel, I think maybe, the vibe, not helpful, okay? If it's an opinion, and it's your opinion, we can tell that from the writing of it. I think you need to use words like, um, on the balance of probabilities. A reasonable person would expect that. Having considered both, uh, both sides, it is more likely A, but we need to keep in mind that if the assumption I referred to in paragraph X is incorrect, then it might be B. Okay, B, just answer the question in other words. Um, verb tenses can get a little bit tricky, as can multiple bullet points by the looks of things for some reason there. Um, most guidelines suggest that you state facts and courts decisions in the past tense. So, he went to the boathouse on XYZ date. In the decision of blah, 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 he said blah, blah, blah. So we talked about that in the past. Um, legal rules in the present sense. 
So in order to have a contract, we must see these elements now. So present tense. Um, and then what your recommendations are. So you should do this. So we talk about the future. In the future, you will need to do that. Get. So don't say you did this when we're talking about a recommendation. You will do that. It kind of makes sense. Um, really useful for an assessment piece to say you haven't, you're still investigating. In real life, you really need to, you need to do that. Sometimes the deadlines, like believe it or not, clients don't give extensions. Um, but yeah, state clearly that you're speculating on a given set of assumptions. Now, there might be some things in this that you say, okay, we need to get more information about X, Y, and Z in order to answer the question. So, you're speculating on the basis that you don't have that information yet, um, but they're rarely useful uh, to say that you're still considering it or you're waiting on a second opinion or you've gone out to tender to see if you can get a barrister or a, you know, expert e to give evidence. Not so helpful. I like this because I think it does almost the exact opposite of what it's telling you to do. It's a quote from Homer E. Moyer, Jr. I think he might be American, do you? Avoid legalisms. Latin phrases, abbreviations and other legalisms are the badges of legal writing. However, they are commonly redundant, usually pretentious and invariably unnecessary. When legalisms punctu punctuate a paragraph, readability suffers. Like lavish capitalization, frequent exclamation marks and underscoring for emphasis, legalisms serve as crutches when plain English would nicely suffice. The addition of supra, arguendo or inter alia rarely amplifies a thought. My favourite Latin phrase is re ipsa locuta. Has anybody, does anybody got Latin scholars here know what it means? The words speak for themselves. If the words spoke for themselves, why don't you say them in English instead of Latin? Latin is a dead language, so let's just say them in English. So some of you are going to be quite keen. Some of you will feel safe, okay? You will feel that by putting everything into passive tense, flowery language, throwing in lots of cases and lots of citations and lots of Latin phrases, you will feel, okay, this makes me sound clever. I don't even understand it myself. I must be really clever. Think about that, okay? Uh, citations, get them right. Think about your reader. We were talking about it before. So think about where you put the if you're going to have an in-text citation, think about where it sits. Have it sit after the point that you're making, ideally. Um, avoid lots of strings, especially in the middle of sentences. Put them in footnotes if you can. Um, excessive use of footnotes, excessive use of quotations don't make you look clever. Be judicious, make some thoughts. Put everything that you referred to in your reference list Okay, but make choices because that helps me work out how people are going. Answer the question. Review the assessment criteria. That's what they are. So 20% for identifying issues, 15% for the rules, 30% for getting the law right. 15% for your conclusion and presentation and referencing. I said 10% before, but it's 20. I must have wiggled it up because it's important to me. Answer the question. If you do nothing else, answer the question. Okay, the question, the one I gave you, not a different question. Like, yeah. Okay, questions, concerns, frustrations. Are you excited? Is anybody actually enjoying themselves doing this? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> I do. I do. I just have more time. I work with half my time on mine. More time can be um, a curse, though, too. Yeah. There's something about actually having boundaries in it. And one of the things, there is a discipline to doing these things. Um, and it's like anything, you know, like 
Uh, I've been trying, um, I've pulled out now because I hurt myself a couple of weeks ago, but I'm, I'm training for a half marathon in May, or I was. And I know that, well, I did one last year, so I know I can do it if I hadn't hurt myself. Uh, and, but I also like, look at me, I'm 52, I'm curvy and I like red wine. Um, you know, it's like running marathons is not going to be my thing, right? So, but in theory, if I run sort of 15 hours a week, um, I should be able to do it pretty easily over a 10 week period. So, but you know, what that actually means is I need to do a couple of hours every day. I can't just say, okay, I've got Saturdays and Sundays, I'll do seven hours one day and I'll do eight hours the other and there's my 15 hours of running, I'll be fine. Like, I'd be dead. Like, that is ridiculous. Anybody tried to learn an instrument? No, in theory, if you practice for one hour a day, you can learn an instrument pretty quickly, you know? Does that mean you can do it in seven straight hours at once a week? No. Our brains and our bodies don't work that way. So there is something about having those constraints and just doing it, but doing it, being mindful, turning on. Don't give yourself seven hours to do it and then organise everything and procrastinate and, you know, and like and I've already shown you, you know, different coloured post-it notes and stuff like that. You know, procrastinate planning, it's awesome, but it's not going to get it written. So, and, and really, you should be writing last. You've got to be gathering your information, you've got to be thinking about it, you've got to work out a way that works for you to gather that information and then put it together. And actually having boundaries, I think, I mean, all of you have boundaries. There are plenty of people in this room who are working full time. There are plenty of people here who are doing four subjects. Um, some of them are working full time. People have kids, we have elderly parents, we have partners, we have lives, we need to get on flights at five o'clock in the morning. We, you know, you know, you can, you can write anywhere, you can think anywhere. Uh, it's actually taking the time to do the research and to do the stuff that's under the water, using that ice blue metaphor again, that's really important. But you know, it's also, it's completely safe. Because like I said, I made that problem up. Like nobody's gonna lose their business or their boat or uh, you know, be chased by the mafia if you get it wrong. It really doesn't matter. Um, but you know, and I don't think you will get it wrong actually. Yeah.